Good evening. My name is Alice Knapp. I'm president of the Ferguson Library, and I would like to welcome you to yet another great civility lecture, and I know you're going to enjoy this one. Um, as I talk and I make my introduction, please take this opportunity to turn off your cell phone or put it on vibrate. I was actually here at a uh, lecture the other night, and everybody put theirs on vibrate, and you could hear the buzzing noises. So you might even want to think about turning it off. We are very fortunate to work very closely with the Dylan Schneider Group and Hearst Media to um, host these lectures on civility. And with that, I'm going to introduce Joe Passani, my main partner in crime in this endeavor, and he will introduce our guest. Thank you, Alice. We have a great treat for you tonight. I came up from the city with Francois, and we talked about everything from the hotel business to metaphysics to the millennial generation. So you're going to be enlightened in many different ways. Francois Olivier Luigi is the general manager of the renowned Pierre Hotel, a Taj Hotel. When I was researching Mr. Luigi, I came upon a story with the very telling headline that said, experienced general manager values his complainers. And I have to tell you, just last week my wife was saying to me, you're a chronic complainer and nobody likes complainers. And I'm going to bring this headline home to her <laughs> and show her the exception to the rule. Let me quote a paragraph from that same story about Mr. Luigi's introduction to the whole notion of hospitality. It said this, Francois Olivier Luigi got a taste, literally, of what it's like to serve people as a boy growing up in France. It was there that his family would gather en masse for holidays in the south of France, some 20 or 30 strong. When it came time to eat, the group did not go to a restaurant. Instead, it was up to Luigi's grandmother to plan and cook every meal for a week for the entire crowd. He said he was the only one in the group fascinated by what his grandmother was doing. Where do we find women like that nowadays? Excuse me, that was almost sexist, I'm sorry. Or men. From those beginnings, Luigi went on to hotel school. Through it all, serving others and matching the needs of guests has been guiding force in his life. His day begins the moment he opens his eyes in the morning and reaches for his phone. From there, he checks on the overnight report and whether there were any complaints. He then reviews the day's performance numbers. Mr. Luigi began his career working in the hotel service, room service, and he said he welcomes every interaction he has with the five-star hotel's guests. He especially welcomes complaints. Quote, if I go to work and nothing happens, I'm disappointed, he said. If no one complains, I can't make any friends. If someone complains, there's a 99.9% .9 chance they will become your best customer. They come with a complaint, you grab it and fix it, and they become your best customer. With over 22 years in the luxury hotel industry, Mr. Luigi has extensive experience launching high-end hotels internationally and managing well-known brands catering to the discerning traveler. His positions have included general manager of Langham Place, Fifth Avenue, hotel manager of the Mark Hotel, and corporate food and be beverage training specialist at Four Seasons, where he developed the brand's culinary teams. He's originally from Corsica, France, and he explained to us it is not Corsica, Italy. And he graduated from ESSEC Business School of France with a joint MBA in hotel management from Cornell University. After completing his studies, he entered the hospitality world through the food and beverage division, quickly rising through the ranks to become the corporate F&B training specialist for the entire Four Seasons brand. While with Four Seasons, he opened 19 of the brand's hotels and resorts, including properties in the Middle East, Europe, and Southeast Asia. He's internationally trained, and he speaks fluent English, French, and Italian. 
This evening he will be speaking to us in English. Thank you. <clears throat> Let me put this here. Hopefully you can hear me. All right. So this was not an encouragement to complain. I never realized that quote would follow me all these years. But yes, as a general manager, really, if nothing happens, I have nothing to do. Um, so thank you for this great introduction. I'm, of course, delighted to be here. And, uh, you know, in this fascinating series, and, uh, of course, following really distinguished speakers. Part of my preparation for this evening was to read uh, the previous speeches. I even found some of them on YouTube. And, you know, and I, was, it was, I couldn't stop. I think I read, I, I got the copy of the three books that were published about this series. It was really, really interesting. Um, and there's two stood out about uh, uh, civility. Um, and really, I, I, I'm just going to give you, start with two quotes. I know it sounds like a college paper opening with a quote, but I thought, I know some of you remember Thomas von Essen. Uh, maybe some of you were here. He was the former fire commissioner of New York City. Uh, and he gave a very, very insightful speech, I thought, for me. Uh, that's his quote I'm going to read. Civility begins when we see other people not as objects or outsiders, but as individuals who have their own personal stories to tell just like us. When you help somebody who is in need in a very direct and personal way, it changes how you feel about them. You know, that was, for me, that's, I think, one of the best definitions of civility I could hear. And of course, with his background from being in the fire department and his great life, all, all the stories he told, the example, were, were very interesting. Another speaker also caught my attention, Jim Douglas. Maybe some of you saw him, he was the former governor of Vermont. And I thought he expressed almost the same idea. Um, when he talked about things get done or don't get done uh, in government and politics, he said, everything depends on seeing people as individuals so that we are, quote, working together, not pulling apart. And I couldn't think of a better description of why uh, the world works so much better when we practice civility. And this is what, with this in mind that I will share a few experiences for, from the hotel business because um, we practice civility every day. There is not a hotel that does not welcome every guest. There's not a restaurant that doesn't serve everyone. It's sort of ingrained in us. Um, and in my world, we call civility courtesy. I think it's the same world. You'll hear a lot of people in the restaurant or hospitality talk about courtesy as being the most important thing you can do. Uh, courtesy is not a luxury thing. It's not something that only if you spend a lot of money you get. It's not me as a five-star hotel. I own courtesy. Courtesy is something you get anywhere. In a one-star hotel, a two-star hotel, can be just as warm, as welcoming as a five-star hotel if the staff practices courtesy. And I'm sure you can think of many interactions you've had where someone has really, you felt someone really paid attention to you and it's nothing to do with how much you paid for it, or where you were. Could happen the simplest spaces. Of course, one two-star hotel cannot offer necessarily the same level of service. We can as a five-star hotel because they don't have enough resources. What we do is trying to put as many people as possible whose only job is to try and be more courteous, find out what you really want, and trying to make your experience more unique. That's the one thing we do. We just have more uh, more staff and make sure that every contact with the guest has a personal courteous touch and you, we can create a positive experience. Now imagine when many of you, you know, hear a French guy say the word five star hotel, you think that the great all European hotels from the grand hotels of Paris, London, you know, Rome, Vienna, just think of any fabulous city, the beautiful palaces, that uh, you know, where everybody was treated like, like royalty. Um, actually, that image is not true. 
the notion of a, of a luxury hotel is an American invention. It is. And a French guy is telling you this. We usually, everything is French and better there, but I'm telling you it's true. I have proof. Um, the European hotels in the 19th century, they were very class conscious. Uh, people of a particular rank or background only stayed in certain places. It's easy to imagine. Uh, places where people who didn't belong were not welcome. Some people would not even think of staying at certain prestigious hotels irrespective of whether you could afford it or not. That was the European model. In America, during the same period, the hotel was springing up at a rapid rate as the nation grew in population and pushed the frontier westward. And I, because of you, I had to read this book uh, to be sure you know, that this is correct. So there's a, great <laughs> there's a great hotel historian called Stanley Turkell. And I hope if, you, if you're interested in hotel facts, he wrote a great book, he wrote many books, but Stanley Turkell wrote a book about great American hoteliers. I have a copy here if you want. It's really, I, I really enjoyed it. Basically, this is, this is what he wrote, so I can quote him. The 30 years prior to the Civil War, Americans built hotels larger and more ostentatious than any in the rest of the world. These hotels were inextricably intertwined with American culture and customs, but were accessible to the average citizen. Now you see why I'm bringing this into the civility discussion. Because the class system was not firmly footed in America, hotels were seen as public buildings, public spaces, meeting-oriented places, and a place where all classes of people mingled together, the wealthy along with workmen and frontiersmen. So what we see today as the great American hotel, uh, the great hotels of the world is an American idea. And all the great hoteliers, again, as a French person, it's hard to say, but they're all, mostly all Americans, from Statler to, to all these great people. Um, the managers of those new hotels had to open their doors to everyone if they wanted to succeed. They treated every guest with, you guessed it, courtesy. You can read some of these employee handbook from 1905 from the Stadler Hotel in Buffalo, it's written on the cover. Be courteous. Treat everybody with respect. Treat everybody the same. It was democracy at work in every sensible and practical way. I hardly have to tell you how profoundly Europe was affected by the events of the 20th century, two world wars, collapse of empires, you know, rigid class system disappearing, great population shift, and especially in recent decades, massive influx of tourists from all over the world. Think of Paris, now probably 70 million visitors in one year. Just New York is 61 million. Uh, the result is that today's five-star hotel now all practice the American system, which is to say, try to deliver the same level of courtesy and service to all guests, whoever they are, whoever they come from. That's the cornerstone of my industry. I like to quote Downton Abbey, I hope you don't mind, for those familiar with British television, but basically, Downton Abbey, the show, it was sort of a very role play. You know, you, everybody had the, there was the uh, lord and ladies upstairs, the servant downstairs. Everybody had a role to play, a very clear role. You would never see the chambermaid serving dinner. You wouldn't see a footman uh, in the wrong place. That was the European model of luxury. All that, of course, has completely gone. Not to say we've become faulty towers. That's another British comedy. But we've, you can see, and sometimes during training, I use this Downton Abbey analogy because the customer, even a luxury customer, does not want someone role-playing their position, if you think about it. You're looking for a more sincere, <coughs> sincere experience, something more real. Um, so people don't want to be typecast. People don't want to be type, sorry, typecast anymore. It's, it's really, and I'm repeating things you've heard already, it's all about me. Um, it's all about being an individual, whether you're an employee or a guest. Uh, and so the challenge for those of us in the luxury hotel business, like the Pierre, is to get you 
to tell us something about you. That's our focus. That's how we see civility. But you have to tell us something about you. Without that information, I cannot personalize your stay and make it special. Without you telling me something about you, it will, I will be role-playing and not be real and sincere. So it's not always easy to find out things about you because a lot of the, another huge trend that's affecting every business everywhere is technology. And for us, it means the slow disappearance of personal transactions as technology becomes a bigger and bigger part of our business. Quick example, we all love checking in on a plane. I mean, you know, it's the most probably awful experience just printing your boarding pass where you sit. And basically, hotel is the same. You know, checking in a hotel, how exciting is that? Uh, so you can see that all the old ways we had to find something out about you are, are disappearing. We can no longer rely on the traditional check-in to find out how we can make your stay special. Um, we can no longer wait for guests to approach the concierge to discover how we can personalize our service. By then, it's too late. So we have to look for new ways to learn about you. And that is why the Pierre today still has um, a courtesy rarely seen today, an elev elevator operators. Do you remember that? That is really surprising because probably elevator operators were among the very first people to lose their job to technology, if you think about it. I'm talking about decades ago. Today, uh, we still employ them. We, they're not just there to press a button. Uh, they're trained to interact with the guest, to learn something about them, make them feel welcome. We start the process by introducing guests who just check in to the elevator operator. You arrive, we check you in, we walk you to the elevator and we introduce you to Katie. So in the morning, on your ride down to the lobby, maybe they'll, they will greet you, not maybe, they will greet you and ask if you have any special plan for the day. Um, in the evening, on your way back, uh, they'll ask you, how is dinner? If you think what well, that means for a moment, these are the new ways, non-transactional, there is, it's just about really you and someone that knows you. And it's turned out to be the most valued service we offer today. And if you're familiar with the Pierre, it's a residential building as well as a hotel. And there's been elevator operators since October 1st, 1930, when the building opened. And they will still be there in a very long time from now. But today, this is one of the most valued people where they have the best memories of the stay with us. Um, I always bring this up. It's not always easy because not every guest is a friendly gives a friendly reply. Some people will not be surprised to hear me say they can be quite unpleasant, demanding, and reasonable, all these things. But how do we deal with the situation? Again, part of civility, right? The answer is that when we hire people, we look for people who are not bothered, who are not easily shaken, who don't take bad behavior personally. Uh, and we know how to stay focused on what's important. It's something you look for. And it doesn't matter. Don't take it personally. Um, you must know people, we all have people like that in, in, in our families. You know, some people have a natural desire to make other people happy. They have a natural desire to serve. Uh, one of the famous hoteliers, Horst Schulze, who was the president of Ritz Carlton, he used to start every speech by saying, to a room like that full of new employees, if you, do not, if you did not wake up this morning wanting to serve people, he said, now is your chance to leave the room. He could say that, I think. <laughs> uh, but everybody sat in the room and said, you know what? 
I wake up in the morning with some people and I want to be here and I want to do the best. Uh, so you have to wake up in the morning wanting to serve others. It's not something you can teach. You cannot teach that sense of purpose. But you can look for it, you can encourage it, and you can try and bring, bring out its best qualities. That doesn't work um, everywhere, of course. You know, um, if you're running a hotel in a remote location or a small island, and then, you know, obviously recruiting uh, human resources, a limited pool, you know, w will make it difficult for you to hire the best staff. And of course, the PR is fortunate to operate in the enormous and diverse New York labor market. So we can be very selective. Uh, New York is a fascinating place. We have access to some of the best people right there who wake up every morning and want to be the best. So uh, we, I feel always blessed every day to be in one of the biggest cities in the country where so many people, it's easy to find who are dedicated to just that. Um, and that gives us a great advantage in creating a culture of courtesy among our almost 600 employees. I think we're about 550. Uh, we never forget, however, that this culture has to start at the top. Uh, all of us in senior management must believe in and practice courtesy and civility in all the interactions. We must be role models. Um, as well as instructors for our staff. I always tell my team, to make it work, you have to mean it. It has to be real. Another way to say it is you cannot go through the motions, pretend you care. It's not possible. You, you've read those lists of things you're supposed to do. If you don't mean it, it will not work. For example, some of you have traveled and, you know, some hotels, uh, you know, if you like, for example, Diet Coke, you know, everywhere you go, there'll be Diet Coke stocked for you in, in your fridge or in your room. But is it good enough if you travel with your family instead of being there for business and all people have noticed about you is you like Diet Coke? So you're here with your family, you could be here for a special occasion and, you know, and the people just go through the motion of whatever the computer says. Somebody typed in your profile that you like Diet Coke and nobody even looks at you anymore. So many five-star brands have become so mechanical that they're trying to rely on technology to really figure you out. But you can tell they just do whatever the computer tells them. Forget to look at you. Um, Another aspect of the Pierre I'd like to share is that we covered, you know, finding the right people, managing from the top. The other side, of course, is how do you monitor yourself? How do you grade yourself? Uh, to, so for us to help maintain the, the, the highest level of courtesy and personal service, we use uh, the Net Promoter Scoring. It's a great book by Fred Reichel, that's, you, that's called the ultimate question. You may have heard it in business. The ultimate question is, will you recommend me? Not will you come back, you may not have the opportunity to come back, but will you recommend my business to someone else? That works to pr for pretty much every business. You leave, will you recommend me? And it's a very important concept. So if you get, for example, 10 reports a day, from guests, eight of them are positive, two are negative. Your score is not 80%, it's 60%. We take the two negative, remove them from the eight positive. That's your net promoter score. So even though you have 80% of the guests saying you're great, actually my score is just 60%. There's no business who can run on 60%. So that's how we had to change also the way we look at guest feedback and comment and how we measure ourselves. Um, Probably now I should give you some examples of courtesy, um, what it really means in practice. So I have a few stories. It's very hard. I went to the team this morning and asked, what's your best story? Uh, what we do is we, because it's so important, every day in every department, people will write their best story of the day. They, they, we collect them. We print them. We have then a, a team of employees who look at them and pick the best three for the month. We give an award every month. So what I'm saying is those stories are very, very meaningful in the fact that this is, if we talk about courtesy, if we mean to have it implemented, you have to measure it, we have to talk about it, 
every day, all the time. You can go to any department in the hotel, even the department that never see a guest. It's they have a board and they can read what their friends did, who had the opportunity to engage with the customer. Um, that, you know, so I think hopefully I picked a few. I'm ready for more if you want. But there was a, one example I like, it happened last month. It's a mother and daughter from Liverpool in England who came to the Pierre to enjoy traditional afternoon tea. It was a big family reunion, it was very emotional, mother, daughter. The server learns that it's the mother's birthday. You don't have to be five star to know that, of course, the waiter went and got a slice of cake and a candle. But instead of singing happy birthday, because they were from Liverpool, I don't know if I have too many soccer fans here, he sang, You Will Not Walk Alone. Do you know, what, do you know that song? That's the anthem of the Liverpool soccer team. The mother sang with him, burst out in tears, and said that's the best thing anybody has done for her. <laughs> These stories are not crazy complicated. It just shows someone find out something and just find a way naturally to turn it around and make it an unbelievable experience. Another one, you could tell at the front desk when the guests arrived that the family had a terrible tragedy. Um, it was too late to order flowers, and yet the, the employee at the front desk thought, you know, I should really send them a note of condolences, you know, how, how mechanical it would have been just to send the usual fruit basket and a bottle of water when these people obviously had a loss in the family. So she remembered that there was a VIP guest that canceled the arrival. So she went to the room, picked up the flower arrangement, wrote a note of condolences, and had that sent right before the usual boring fruit basket showed up. But for that guest, it meant that the person at the desk showed compassion made it happen, and they did not have to go through, you know, I like Diet Coke, and here's my food basket. They were so touched, so touched, that they actually wrote me a, a letter that, you know, they have never felt so welcomed by anyone. All it took is acknowledging why they are the hotel for, and then being empowered to do something about it. Another one, I know some of you have kids, the host of the restaurant notices a family there for brunch. And their daughter was visibly uncomfortable, displaying signs that that child was probably finding the crowds in the restaurant, a public space, a great source of anxiety. The parents trying to calm her down, gave her a favorite toy, which happened to be Elmo. So the host called the pastry shop. It helps, of course, to have a pastry shop with pastry chefs. And ask them, you know, why don't you just a couple of cookies and just put decorate with Elmo? They brought the plates to the table. The daughter was so happy that someone paid attention to her, just the right way. The mother started crying and said thank you, and they had the most wonderful brunch. So these are the few few examples. Uh, I'll give you one more, and then you have to tell me to stop, otherwise I keep going. Uh, another guest, I like that one because that one took some thinking, but this guest uh, got sick. It was last January. It was a blizzard in New York. There's nothing they could do. They were sick. They had all these activities planned in New York. And the weather was only making things worse. So that employee remembered that we had left over, I don't know why, but a DVD showing a fireplace. You know, you can put that on your TV and watch a fake fire. So again, instead of the turn down service and your delicious chocolate on the pillow, uh, they had put uh, the television on with the fireplace and put, uh, you know, a little setup so you can make yourself a cup of tea and all that. And again, you know, something simple like that, the guest was so impressed that someone acknowledged just what they said. So I hope I've given you some some example of courtesy and civility in the hotel business, but it's hard to speak about the hotel business without um, talking about the rest of the world. You know, how could this, uh, how can we apply those lessons? And it's hard not to talk about the airline business because we keep hearing about them all the time. <laughs> and we've all heard, you know, 
uh, we've all had uh, lost luggage, delayed flights, route treatment, but the incident that really got our attention was, of course, that poor gentleman who was kicked off a plane on an overbooked flight. That seemed to prove what we all suspected, that airlines have really misplaced their sense of concern for their customers. Now, I'd, I'd like to give them always a little excuse. You know, they're not always on target faults. I mean, they don't control the airport. They don't control the ground crews in most airports. It's listed out that it should matter. But it's, you could at least give them some reason. They also don't control the, the weather. And I could admit that a lot of the negative experience just starts at the airport itself. Uh, but there is no question that many of them have become so focused on cutting costs, squeezing every last penny of every possible flight, that they have completely forgotten how to make the passengers a priority. One airline, I don't know if I should officially name them, but you may remember, tried to go as far as to charge to use the bathroom on the plane. It's not in the United States, it's in England. But they failed, thank God, because it was so crazy. But they really said, we're going to charge to use the bathroom on the plane. Not every airline is guilty of this. I like to use the example of Delta. Um, I have friends who work there. And they've also had their fair share of public relations issues. But it's, I think it's operating policy of, you know, offers room to be optimistic. I don't know if some of you follow, but the executives are rewarded based on passenger feedback. They look at daily incident reports the way hotels do, and the employees are motivated by profit sharing. I don't know if you follow, but you can look it up. It's quite interesting. Last year, I think the payouts to the employee uh, profit sharing plan was over a billion dollars. So you have to believe that at least if they try to make it from the top, that customer is a priority, that it would have to translate down the entire organization to eventually lead to better service. And I think it does. Uh, more generally, we all have to recognize that no matter what business we're in, you know, technology keeps changing everything uh, and lets people go in all sorts of new direction. You know, technology is very good at finding a gap. If there's a gap in service, something's missing, technology will grab it. I'll make a quick point. For example, if, I don't know if you realize, but Brooklyn is, I think, could be, I think, the fourth largest city in America, just on its own. And until about a couple of decades ago, had exactly zero hotels. Not one, zero. How can Brooklyn have not one single hotel? So, of course, Airbnb, if you follow uh, the, on the travel news, you will see it's the inventor of Airbnb in New York City. is tens of thousands of rooms, but it's really providing accommodation for 4 million people who may have their family visiting or people want to be in Brooklyn. It's so trendy. So, of course, Airbnb jumped in. And we all know Uber, you know, you can get a taxi. Well, if you can get a taxi in New York at 5 o'clock, then Uber is going to put 10,000 cars on the street. Uh, you know, but... All these people who invent these things have the same problem we do. They have to figure out how to provide a better service. Maybe their methods are different from sort of traditional jobs like mine, but the goal is the same. You have to keep customers coming back. So the question is whether they can maintain their success over the long term and build loyalty, of course, and then be courteous and show some civility. And if you look back at Airbnb, Uber, there's plenty of example that it's lacking. So my only advice as a conclusion <laughs> for someone who works is one of the oldest business to some of the newest, especially in technology, is you always improve your chance of survival when civility is built into your culture and when courtesy is your operating standard. To repeat what I said before, um, you really have to mean it. Thank you. I hope it was interesting, and thank you again for the opportunity to let me speak today. Now, 
Please ask me a lot of questions. That's what I'm used to. I'm not used to standing at a podium. I try to read my speech the best I could. Yes. What if someone is not happy with their room and you're, what happens if someone is not happy with their room and you're booked? Are there always extra rooms that you have that you don't? It sounds like it's a case where a French accent is not going to be able to solve that problem, right? <laughs> so if you're stuck, you, you, we, you always have to show empathy, meaning and mean it, understand what is the problem. And if it's a matter of waiting a couple of days and then something better will come, then hopefully you'll be able to help the guests with that, understanding that decision. There is, you know, hotels are like airline, it's full, it's full. But the difference with an airline is that an airline, everybody boards at the same time, leaves at the same time, at least in a hotel, there's always a miracle. Someone leaves early or, you know, come a day later. So we always have much more flexibility than any airline. New York City, I mean, people check in at 6 a.m., people check in at midnight, people leave early, leave late. It's, so we have a lot of flexibility, and usually we're able to solve a problem within at least 12 hours, something will happen. But if you're at a destination that is like a resort, everybody comes Saturday, everybody leaves Saturday, not a lot you can do if you're full. You know, some people think of Hawaiian Resort or Puerto Vallarta or whatever, some, or the Caribbean for the holidays. I mean, it's full, it's full. There is nothing they can do. I answered your question? Yes. Okay, let me take you in a slightly different direction. Thank you. Uh, after 2008 incident at the Taj Hotel in Mumbai, there was an article written in different places, but the one that comes to mind is the one in Harvard Business Review. Yes. Which basically pointed out the training at Taj yeah. was such that it came into value at, at times that most hotels don't plan for. Plan for. You, know, you don't plan for those incidents. Yes. So would you like to comment on the yes. training that you know, how it... Thank you very much for bringing this up. I was not sure how to weave in the Taj culture. I'll give a little bit of background for the people. I'm not sure everybody's familiar. Taj is, the, uh, is probably one of, part of the largest uh, group in India called the Tata Group. The Taj Hotel was founded in about 1895. Of, I'm not sure exactly the date. They opened a beautiful hotel called the Taj Mahal in Mumbai. And the founder of the Tata Group and the Taj Hotel was knew from there a hundred years ago that it was all about courtesy, welcoming everyone. If you put it back in the historical context of, you know, colonial India by the British, you could easily understand that a British-run hotel was not a welcoming place for everyone. It was strictly reserved for British ladies and gentlemen. So fast forward to 2008, the terrible, um, uh, some of you may remember, uh, a terrorist attack where people came by boat and attacked the hotel killed 100 people, set it up on fire. It was atrocious. And the team of the hotel was able to evacuate and show such an understanding of their call of duty that it became the case for a very famous Harvard Business Review article that looked at how come you can get 800 employees, 1,000 employees, all knowing what to do in such a horrific case and save 1,000 people. So yeah, it took, that means that the training is real. Uh, it was meaningful. It was lived from the top. It, was, it transpired for the entire organization, the fact that the customer is the most important. And you could, and at the end, training is role playing. Sometimes I forget to bring this up. You have to practice. You don't get a lecture. You role play in front of your friends. You practice and role play. So yeah, that was really, it showed that uh, the, the training, the Taj, uh, really worked. Taj owns the Pierre since 2005 and has really helped us also the Pierre find its sort of identity as far as customer service. Let me just add one yeah. more point here, which is, I mean, you talked about civility and it really comes down to really caring about people. Yeah. And I think it was the caring, yeah. I think that probably made a difference. Yes. A sincere, genuine caring from the top down. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful talk tonight. Have you found that over your years in the, in the business that guests' expectations around the uh, courtesy they think they're going to receive 
have changed or shifted, maybe with the uh, inclusion of technology in the, in the industry? Yes, uh, expectations have changed and are changing rapidly. Um, guest expectation of courtesy is expectation to know who I am, to really understand that uh, much more than ever before. Again, people are not interested in following a role play. You know, it has to be personalized. And that sounds nice on paper, but how do you build an organization that makes money and has you know, hundreds of employees dedicated to figure out who you are? So it means that at our level, a lot of processes, things have to change. The way we talk with each other, the way we try and figure things out is really changing rapidly. One of the new trends you will see, uh, talking about again how guests expect to be treated, is that the front desk, as you understand it, will disappear. It's already disappeared out of a lot of hotel. And if you think how bad you think of checking in on an airplane, you know, for a flight, the, 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 at the end, being a five-star hotel, why should I make you wake online and wait to get a key in a world where everything all that is can be solved by technology? So the way people expect to be treated, greeted, it's changing rapidly. Anything that is transactional is disappearing, and we are there as guilty as everyone else because there's some things we don't expect to do anymore. So I always like to think of a bed and breakfast. Some of us must have, may have done it. You don't have a check-in desk at the bed and breakfast. Somehow the owner is coming, give you a key, making you feel welcome in the house. You get your room, you have breakfast together. I mean, where is the front desk? Do you need a front desk? So if a, how big a bed and breakfast can be before they're gonna build a front desk to make you feel not welcome. So it's gone. Actually, <laughs> Marriott, Starwood, they are the biggest company in the world. They are trying to figure it out. There's a lot of examples of hotels with eliminated front desks. So what does it mean? It means that me as a five-star hotel, if a one-star hotel, two-star, they already figured it out, why should I charge you $200 more for the glorious pleasure of waiting online at the desk? So it means that the entire arrival has to change. I have to, I wish I could figure out exactly what taxi or car you're coming out of so I can greet you by and have your key ready. But it goes back to the point I made quickly before, the more you let us know things about you, the better your luxury experience, which is my background, will be. And you will see that's gonna be one of the biggest change for hotels in the future. I had a question about the stories. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a book that you have compiled of these stories over the years? And if not, when can we get one? <laughs> no. Do you know, this is a, actually I work, as you heard before, for Four Seasons and all that, but that's a Taj initiative. I have to say it's one of the best things I've ever seen. Taj does that in all their properties for a very long time. They encourage people to speak up and find how you do things. Uh, so they have a book, I'm sure. We just have to change the people's name. Uh, but it's interesting because I don't have crazy stories to share. I mean, I'm sure there's some rock star who trashed a room, but we charged them and we get a new room the next day. So even that's not such a big deal. You get a free renovation. But it's to find ways to really make a connection. It's always the simplest. You may think of certain things that have been done, you've appreciated, done when you traveled, you know, that, that, that's what's so important. Yes, I have a collection of my stories, but I'm not allowed to publish them, I think. <laughs> so when my wife and I next check into your hotel, <laughs> which will be for the first time, <laughs> how should we let you know in advance so you know something about us? Well, the good news is if you've booked directly through us or through a travel agent, we will sort of know how to reach you and contact you. And that's why the travel agency industry has actually boomed, as opposed to disappear. Uh, everybody says, oh, Expedia, Booking.com, it's the end of the travel agent. But the travel agent has never done better. Because it's obvious, you don't need a travel agent to book a flight to Washington, D.C., to New York, or whatever. You don't need anybody. But you do need someone when you plan a special trip. And you, why do it alone? You go through a travel agent. 
Plan your vacation, plan your trip, make it special, tell them everything there is to know about why you're going there. And if you wanna, if you wanna treat your family or do something really special, come to New York, call the hotel. Chat with the people on the phone. Ask them questions. What's the best view? What's the best thing? I have a small kid. I have a big kid that they get bored. They want things to do. I mean, and you should spend half an hour on the phone. That's why it will make me feel better because I have six people, <laughs> pay six people to answer the phone just to answer those questions. But yeah, if you, it's all about getting to know you. Share the information. The, the, always say why you travel. Always call the hotel before you go somewhere. And if they don't respond to you, they're, they're not worthy of your business. So book, call your travel agent. That's my, it's on record, I hope. <laughs> no. Anybody else? How do you experience millennials differently than earlier generations? Well, I'm told I'm not allowed to say I hate them because that doesn't go well normally. <laughs> and I have my sister is a millennial and you have children. I'm sure you've raised wonderful kids who are millennial. Uh, but it's really very different. And, uh, and it actually, it's probably the largest group full of travelers. Bigger than baby boomers, numbers are there. So what do we, how do we adapt? You know, they're telling us pretty clearly what they want, you know, things the thing that should be automated should be automated, and the thing that should be personal needs to be personal. There's really, there's no, um, there is no gray area here. A millennial traveler, they, they actually, they've done something great for our business. They have hotels put back lobbies where you can sit and hang out, which they thank you to the millennial, because the hotel used to have lobbies where you could sit and hang out, and then suddenly you go to a hotel, there's a plastic plant, and up, poof, you go right through it, you wonder why they even put one. Uh, so thanks to the, one of the biggest contribution, and that came through those uh, boutique hotel brands that came on the market 10 years ago, 15 years ago, where the lobby became the centerpiece of these new hotels. And you see that the Pierre, where we had a lobby that was built in 1930, with bar, lounge, all these things, we put it back as a lobby now. That's one of the biggest contributions. And I think that traveler for a city hotel, you know, travel is looking for more social experiences. Today, as a luxury provider, to attract a millennial customer, I have to help them make connections social connection within the lobby, within the city, within the hotel, and really, uh, I think that's going to be our new role. I hope I answered your question. Um, uh, in the last few years, there have been some big problems in hotels in New York, uh, bed bugs. In fact, uh, there is a very big there a lawsuit, in fact, more than one, involving some luxury hotels uh, how do you explain the, pro the presence of bed bugs in a uh, luxury hotel? So I will debunk a couple of myths about bed bugs already. One is you can see them. They are not this invisible creature that lurks around. You can see them. It's a visible thing. So I know that we, the hotels, are, we always train the team to, to see if there is an infection problem. So I think it's, you know, New York is a port of entry people from all over the world. They should be expect some problem but you expect the hotels to know to train to spot those problem and fix them it's pretty easy to fix it's not that difficult to see it's not invisible and they sh sometimes I'm surprised how some of those things get out of hands in the, in the bigger hotels because it's pretty easy to train the staff to spot to fix the problem Francois, thank you very much. Uh, and I'm sure some of the guests thank will you. check in. Thank you very much. June 13th, we'll have the editor-in-chief of The Economist. We'll talk about the future of Western civilization. So you want to be here for that. Thank you, Francois.